Hello, so I am Dr. Gillette and we're going to be covering the remainder of chapter two in this online lecture. This is about chemical reactions, so let's get started. Okay, so with our chemical reactions, I want to make sure to emphasize a few things here. Um, anytime we have a reaction in which the substances, or in this case, the elements or atoms are changed, um, and the reason they're changed is because we actually make or break chemical bonds, we call that a chemical reaction. So if we're changing our atoms or substances, and the way we're changing them is by making new bonds, or by breaking new bonds, that is a chemical reaction. When we're talking about a chemical reaction, on the left side of the reaction, before we start, we call those items reactants. So let's say we're baking a cake. That will be things like butter, sugar, eggs, and flour, even though I spelled that like an actual flour, so my apologies there. Right here is going to be basically where your energy is because we'll talk about in a little bit all reactions need energy, but then you end up with some type of product. So of course, once we add all those things together, we're going to end up with a pound cake. If you think about it, a pound cake is going to be very different than a stick of butter. It's going to be very different than a cup of sugar. So all of those reactants are going to change and then give us some type of product. With these chemical reactions, they're all going to require some type of energy, so some source of energy, which if we're baking a cake, that energy would be heat. In living organisms, these reactions require an enzyme, which will help to speed up the process. And then also, these reactions tend to occur in, a, in one direction, right? So once we go in that direction, we don't typically go back, right? We're gonna take our eggs, flour, sugar, butter, we're going to go in the direction to make a pound cake, and once we're there, we do not go back and then end up having eggs, butter, sugar. It has changed, it's moved in the direction. Lastly, most chemical reactions are going to occur in a liquid, for the most part, it's water. This is just an example again, showing on the left side, you have your reactants, and on the right, you have your products. So let's talk about water really briefly. <clears throat> I'm not gonna ask you too many questions about this, but I do want you to just understand how critical water is. Water is um, all around us and it's essential for our life. So these are just some critical facts about water I wanted to share with you. The structure of water is something we've kind of talked about a little bit. So you see water is H2O, and that means we're gonna have one molecule of oxygen in the middle, paired up with two molecules of hydrogen. Once water begins to form, this forms a bond in which we share the electron. So you see the electron from the hydrogen paired with the electron from the oxygen is going to create this bond. Remember when we share electrons, this is called a covalent bond. So water is going to actually be a covalent bond between the oxygen molecules and the hydrogen molecules. More specifically, it forms a polar covalent bond because if you look at this oxygen molecule, it's a lot bigger. So remember, it has a higher electronegativity. It has a higher electronegativity. It can actually pull the electrons towards it towards the center because remember the center has more protons and the positive protons pull the negative electrons and that's going to create an area in which oxygen is a little or slightly negative and the hydrogen is a little or slightly positive. So we see that depicted here. Our oxygen took way too many electrons because it's bigger so that's going to cause a slight negative charge as compared to our hydrogens which are slightly positive. Between that water molecule, like we talked about, anytime you see dashed lines, that's going to represent a hydrogen bond. And this shows that the slightly negative oxygen will kind of form a little attraction or crush to the slightly positive hydrogen. So that's going to form what we call a hydrogen bond. And this shows in more detail how water is a polar covalent molecule. 
Water is also a solvent, which means um, it's going to be useful for helping to dissolve substances. So let me give you a little hint here. A solute is going to be a dissolved substance, like the actual thing that you're putting inside the water, and the solvent is the liquid. To remind you, think of the V for solvent and maybe like a vase where you put a flower at. That's where the water goes, right? Solvent, V, vase, water, liquid. So a solvent is the liquid. The solute is the thing that you dissolve inside of it. So if you're making a pitcher of Kool-Aid, the sugar would be the solute and the water would be the solvent. So it's important that you know water is usually a solvent in a lot of uh, reactions in our body. If we're talking about a solution in which water truly is the solvent, um, we call this an aqueous solution. So it looks a lot like aqua, but we call this an aqueous solution. So anytime we have an ion, which remember has a slight charge, or molecules that are polar covalent, they will dissolve very easily in water. That's because, remember, water has a little bit of a charge, right? There's some slightly positive and slightly negative sides to it. So if we put an ion here, which let's say it's plus two, it's going to be able to interact with the negative oxygen. If we put something here that is an anion, so it's a negative ion, it can interact with the positive sides of hydrogen. So that's one reason why ions or other molecules that are polar covalent can dissolve in water very easily. Once we're talking about water as a solvent, there are three different types of environments we can expect. One is called hydrophilic, which is water loving. So if you've seen, you know, or know about, of course, Philadelphia, it's the city of brotherly love. The study of philanthropy, it talks about like interacting with people and the love that we have. Um, so water loving, hydro is water, fill is love. That means water loving. So any molecule that is hydrophilic will dissolve very easily in water. These are going to be molecules that are ionic and or molecules that are polar covalent. Hydrophobic, hydro means water, phobia or phobic means fear. So you might have heard some people are claustrophobic, meaning they don't like to be in small spaces. Some people have arachnophobia, they're afraid of spiders, um, all those type of things. This means water fearing. So this is going to be for a solute that does not dissolve in water, and it's going to be nonpolar. So remember, our nonpolar molecules, um, like things like oils, they don't have a charge. So once you drop them in water, where water has a charge, it's not going to interact with it. So nonpolar means they're all fine. If you put it in a space with water and where the water is going to have a charge, this is not going to cause an interaction. So like when you add oil and water together, they're very separate. They don't interact with each other. That oil is hydrophobic, it's water fearing. And finally, amphipathic, amphi means both. Some people are like ambidextrous and stuff like that. But amphipathic means both. And this is for molecules that basically have both a polar region and a non-polar region. So part of it loves the water. That's the polar side. It's hydrophilic. Part of it hates the water. That's the non-polar side. That's hydrophobic. They're going to form a um, substance called a micelle in water. So what does a micelle look like? A micelle is where you have the polar or hydrophilic, meaning water-loving regions, on the surface, right? So think of it like a, a circle right here. These little blue parts are the hydrophilic or polar parts. They love water, so they want to interact with the red water molecules on the outside. However, there are some portions of it, these little white tails here, that are pointed inward. And when they're pointed inward towards the interior, that means they do not want to interact with the water. So think about, um, let's say an orange, right? The rind or the outside of the orange, that interacts with the air, but the inside of the orange never interacts with the air, right? So that's going to be your nonpolar versus your polar. One place you may have seen this is micellular water. So it's a makeup um, cleanser. Think about maybe um, a lot of mascara is waterproof, but foundation might be water-based. So on your face, you have some things that like water, some things that don't like water. 
this uses the power of my cells, right? So something that has parts that are good for the water part of your makeup and then parts that are good for the anti-water or hydrophobic parts of your makeup so that you can actually get your makeup off in one swipe. Um, we talked, or this is in the slide deck talking about the three states of H2O, but we are not going to cover it in this uh, class. And also this slide here about the structure of water. So this kind of wraps up our chemical reactions and let's talk about pH really briefly. So pH and buffers, this is important because these um, pH plays a major role in how different substances interact with each other. So the pH actually stands for potential of hydrogen, pH. Um, and this is just a mathematical way that we use to be able to identify the number of hydrogen ions in any solution. So H plus, anything that's hydrogen ion in a solution, we want to use that to determine the pH. Because of that, we have this scale called a pH scale. And this scale will help us determine how acidic something is or how basic a solution will be. So it runs from like 1 to 14, sometimes you see 0 to 14. And all of these are actually a log of 10. The only reason I say that is I want you to understand going from a pH of one to two is a very big difference, even though, of course, the numbers are just one to two. All right, very important here. And we'll look at this picture as well. Anything that's on the left side or from 6.999 down to zero is going to be acidic. It's going to be an acid. The closer we get to zero or one, the more hydrogen ions we have, the less hydroxyl or OH groups we have. Okay, so like this graph is showing, this little triangle, the closer we are to the bottom part of the pH um, scale, the more hydrogens we have, the less OH groups we have. Seven is neutral, it's a literally an even split. And finally, the same thing applies, 7.01 up to 14, it's going to be more basic or you're going to have a low amount of hydrogen ions, a high amount of these OH or hydroxyl groups. So let's break this down a little more. Like I said, a neutral solution is gonna be right in the middle. I don't know if you can tell, but the hy hydrogen ions and the hydroxide ions come together to form water, right? H2O, you see how everything works together, H2O. Um, so when you're talking about a neutral solution, that means that this solution is going to dissociate or separate. That's a fancy word for separate. It's going to separate evenly. So it's going to separate evenly into hydrogen ions and evenly into hydroxide ions. You see, you got two red hydrogens, two green hydroxide groups. That's even. That means it's neutral. That's right at seven. Anything that's acidic. That means when you drop it in water, when you put it in water, it's going to release hydrogen ions, more hydrogen ions than it does hydroxyl groups. So the acidity of a substance depends on how quickly it dissociates. So a strong acid, as soon as you drop them in the water, they're going to break apart almost immediately. So if you drop a hundred, um, molecules in a water in water for a strong acid all 100 of them are going to break apart in in seconds a weak acid is going to kind of keep some of its state so if i drop 100 weak acids in a solution maybe 25 of them will split the other 75 will stay the same so it doesn't split apart very quickly a great example of this is hydrochloric acid hydrochloric acid is very it will burn you um, so anything that's on the strong acid side, if it's closer to zero or one, it will have, it will be stronger and it will increase more burns. That's very important. It also has a very high hydrogen concentration. Basics are the opposite solution. So a base is going to either take up those hydrox hydrogen ions or release OH ions into the solution. Sometimes we refer as basic solutions as being alkaline. So they either um, produce more OHs or they will suck up the hydrogens that are around. The strength of the base, again, is determined by how quickly it can separate in water. So a strong base will dissociate or separate almost completely the same way a strong acid will do. 
Very important. A strong base can burn you just as quickly as a strong acid can. If you touch something that's a base that's a 13, it will burn you quicker than an acid that's a five, right? So however close it is to the ends of the scale, that is going to be stronger. So just keep that in mind. An example of so is sodium hydroxide. So that's going to be a strong base. Again, our scale is going to show zero to 14. Our acids are zero to like right under seven where the lower end has high hydrogens. The closer to neutral, it's low hydrogens. And then you start switching over to talking about the base uh, basics, which have high hydroxide groups near the 14 and low hydroxide groups near the eight. Uh, pH is so critical because it's going to shape, uh, determine how our molecules function. It's going to affect the rate of our reactions, the ability of the molecules to bind, and also the ability of ions or molecules to dissolve in water. Um, this is critical. We have a lot of bodily functions that work this way. So remember, our blood carries our oxygen. Um, so the moment we start changing that pH of the liquid, it can affect how different um, molecules can carry the oxygen or how hormones work or even things in your brain such as neurotransmitters. And finally, a buffer is used um, to be able to tolerate small changes. So it helps to maintain a consistent pH. What does a buffer do? If I have a buffer in a solution and I begin to add hydrogens, it will suck up the hydrogen so that the pH stays the same. If I have a buffer in a solution and it's at a 10, which is basic, and I start adding hydrogen groups, which will naturally bring it down to make it an acid, the buffer will suck them up so that our pH does not change. So the buffer is there to make sure that anytime we add extra hydrogens or extra hydroxide group, it's going to suck them up as much as it can so that it keeps and maintains our pH. We don't want our pH to change, so the buffer helps to select or catch anything that would have altered our pH. We're done for the lecture today, um, but I hope that this is useful and again, follow up with any questions.